love history, there is always something new to learn, or perhaps I should say old. I find that as I acquire items for my collection, I am inclined to research them and learn surprising new things. History is always an adventure, it always has been for me. Recently, <clears throat> I purchased some really nice relics from a good friend of mine, Gil Barry Alberg, here in Saginaw. Um, in these was a souvenir of the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, which was also known as the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. Of course, I was aware of this event, but didn't know how much or didn't know much about it until I acquired this particular piece. This uh, souvenir of the fair consists of a very nice 1904 Indian head penny, which is placed in a larger disc of aluminum. On one side, the token reads, World's Fair, 1904, St. Louis, while on the other side, it reads, Keep Me and Never Go Broke. The exposition held in St. Louis, Missouri in 1904, um, and uh, historians generally emphasize the prominence of themes of race and empire, and the fair's long-lasting impact impact, excuse me, on intellectuals in the fields of history, art, um, architecture, and anthropology. From the point of view of the memory of the average person who attended the fair, it primarily promoted entertainment, um, consumer goods, and popular culture. In 1904, as I've said, St. Louis hosted a, a World's Fair to celebrate the centennial of the 1803 Louisiana Purchase. It was delayed from a planned 1903 opening to, um, to 1904 in order to allow for full-scale participation by more states and foreign countries. The fair opened April 30, 1904, and it closed on December 1, 1904. St. Louis had held an annual St. Louis Exposition since the 1880s as agricultural, trade, and scientific exhibitions, but this event was not held in 1904 due to the World's Fair. The fair's 1,200-acre site was designed by George Kessler, and it was located at the present-day grounds of Forest Park and on the campus of Washington University. It was the largest fair to that date. There were over 1,500 buildings connected by some 75 miles of roads and walkways. It is said to be impossible to give even a hurried glance at everything that was there in less than a week, and the Palace of Agriculture, of Agriculture alone covered some 20 acres. Exhibits were staged by 62 foreign nations, the United States government, and 43 of the then 45, U.S. states. These featured in, uh, industries, cities, private organizations, and corporations, theater troops, and music schools. There also were over 50 concession-type amusements found on the pike. They provided educational and scientific displays, exhibits, and imaginary travel to distant lands, history, and pure entertainment. A total of 19,694,855 individuals in attendance during the months that the fair was open, one of which bought and, and saved this token that I have that uh, prompted my curiosity. In conjunction with the exposition, the U.S. Post Office issued a series of five uh, commemorative stamps celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase and values the series featured one, two, three, five, and ten cent issues, um, a couple of them quite costly. Now, I wondered a lot about the buildings, which were, uh, which were many and built just for the exposition. All but one, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition's Grand Neoclassical Exhibition, palaces were temporary structures designed to last but a year or two. They were built of a material called staff, being a mixture of plaster and hemp fibers on a wood frame. Needless to say, the statues and buildings deteriorated during the months of the fair and needed regular patching. Now, for the rest of, the, of this, I'm indebted um, <clears throat> mostly to Wikipedia, which has a wonderful report on the uh, 1904 World's Fair. The Palace of Fine Art, designed by architect Cass Gilbert, featured a grand interior sculpture court based on the Roman baths of Caracalla, and standing at the top of Art Hill, it now serves as the home of the St. Louis Art Museum. The administration building, designed by Cope and Stewardson, is now Brookings Hall, 
the defining landmark on the campus of Washington University, and a similar building was erected at Northwest Missouri State University, founded in 1905 in Maryville, Missouri. The grounds layout um, was also recreated in Maryville and now is designated as the official Missouri State Arboretum. Some mansions from the exposition's era survive along Lindell Boulevard at the north border of Forest Park. The huge birdcage at the St. Louis Zoological Park dates to the fair. A Jain temple carved out of teak stood within the Indian pavilion near the Ferris wheel. It was dis <coughs> dismantled after the exhibition was, and was over and was reconstructed in Las Vegas at the Castaway Hotel. It has recently been reassembled and is now on display at the Jane Center of Southern California at Los Angeles, Birmingham, Alabama's iconic cast iron um, uh, Vulcan statue was first exhibited at the fair in the uh, place of mines and metallurgy. And if it sounded like I skipped a period and a stop. You're right, I did. Sorry about that. The Missouri State Building was the largest of the state buildings as Missouri was the host state. Though it had sections with marble floors and heating and air conditioning, it was planned to be a temporary structure. However, it burned the night of, uh, of November 18th through the night... Um, and 19th, just 11 days before the fair was to end. Most of the interior was destroyed, but some contents were rescued without damage, including some furniture and much of the contents of the fair's model library. Since the fair was almost over, the building was not rebuilt. After the fair, the current World's Fair Pavilion in Forest Park was built on the site of the Missouri building with profits from the fair in 1909 and 1910. <clears throat> Festival Hall, designed by Cass Gilbert and used for large-scale musical pageants, contained the largest organ in the world at the time, built by the Los Angeles Art Organ Company. And after the fair, it was placed into storage and eventually purchased by John Wanamaker for his new Wanamaker's store in Philadelphia, where it became known as the Wanamaker Organ. The famous bronze eagle in the Wanamaker store also came from the fair. It features hundreds of hand-formed bronze feathers and was a centerpiece of one of the many German exhibits at the fair. Wanamaker's became a Lord and Taylor store and more recently a Macy's store. Completed in 1913, the Jefferson Memorial Building was built near the main entrance to the exposition at Lindell and D. Balavere. It was built with proceeds from the fair to commemorate Thomas Jefferson, who initiated the Louisiana Purchase, as was the first memorial to the third president. It became the headquarters of the Missouri His History Museum and stored the exposition's records and archives when the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Company completed its mission. The building is now home to the Missouri History Museum, and the museum was significantly expanded in 2002-2003. And the State of Maine building, which was a rustic cabin, was transported to Point Lookout, Missouri, where it overlooked the White River by sportsmen um, who formed the Maine Hunting and Fishing Club in 1915 when the main building at the College of the Ozarks in Forsyth, Missouri burned, the school re relocated to Point Lookout where the main building was renamed the Dobbins Building in honor of the school president. The Dobbins Building unfortunately burned in 1930 and the college's signature church was built in its place and in 2004 a replica of the main building was built on the campus. The Keter Center is named for another school president. The exposition's wireless tower was purchased after the fair by Charles N. Rick, a banker from Hot Springs, Arkansas, who moved it to uh, the summit of Hot Springs Mountain for use as an observation tower. Renamed the Rick Tower, it reopened to the public on its new location in 1906. Dismantling and reassembling the tower, however, proved to be its worst enemy. It had previously been moved once before to St. Louis and from, Buff or from Buffalo, New York. It was eventually demolished in 1975 due to instability, almost certainly caused by being re relocated twice. A more modern tower would later be built on the site in 1983. Westinghouse Electric sponsored the Westinghouse Auditorium, where they showed films of, Washing of Westinghouse factories and products. Now there was the introduction, introduction excuse me, of some new foods at, at this particular World Fair that are staples now. A number of foods have 
are claimed to have been invented at the fair, the most popular claim is that the waffle-style ice cream cone was invented and first sold during the fair. However, it is widely believed that it was not invented at the fair, but instead it was popularized at the fair. Either way, it fixed it firmly in our culture here in the United States. Other claims are more dubious, including hamburger and hot dogs, um, both traditional American foods, peanut butter, iced tea, and cotton candy. It is more likely, however, that these foods were first introduced to mass audiences and popularized at the fair. Dr. Pepper and Puff Wheat cereal were first introduced to a national audience at the fair. The fair inspired, inspired the song Meet Me in St. Louis, Louis, which was recorded by many artists, including Bill Murray. Both the fair and the song are focal points of the 1944 feature film Meet Me in St. Louis, starring uh, the great Judy Garland, who was also inspired uh, a Broadway musical version. Scott Joplin wrote the Rag Cascades in order to, to elaborate in honor of the elaborate waterfalls in front of Festival Hall. Following the Spanish-American War, the United States acquired new territories such as Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. Some natives from these areas were brought to be on display at the fair. Such displays included the Apache of the American Southwest and the Igorot of the Philippines, both of which peoples were dubbed as primitive. Similarly, members of the Southeast Alaskan Tlingit tribe accompanied 14 totem poles, two native houses, and a canoe displayed at the Alaska exhibit. In contrast, the Japan, the, the Japan Pavilion advanced the idea of modern yet exo exotic culture unfamiliar to the turn of the century Western world, much as it had during the earlier Chicago World's Fair. Atabenga, a Congolese pygmy, was featured at the fair. Later, he was given the run of the grounds at the Bronx Zoo in New York and then featured in an exhibit on evolution alongside an orangutan in 1906, but public protests, thank goodness, <coughs> ended that. One exhibit of note was Beautiful Jim Key, the educated Arabian Hamiltonian cross horse in his Silver Horseshoe Pavilion. He was owned by Dr. William Kay, an African-American Native American former slave who became a respected self-taught veterinarian and promoted by Albert R. Rogers, who had Jim and Dr. Key on tour for years around the U.S., helping to establish a humane movement that encouraged people to think of animals as having feelings and thoughts and not just as brutes. Jim and Dr. K became national celebrities along the way, and Rogers invented highly successful marketing strategies still used today. Jim K could add, subtract, use a cash register, spell with blocks, tell time, and give opinions on the pol politics of the day by shaking his head yes or no. Jim thoroughly enjoyed his act. He performed more than just tricks and appeared to clearly understand what was going on. Dr. K's motto was that Jim <clears throat> was taught by kindness instead of the whip, which indeed he was. After the fair was completed, many of the international exhibits were not returned to their country of origin, but were dispersed to museums in the United States. For example, the Philippine exhibits were acquired by the National Muse or by the Museum of Natural History at the University of Iowa. The Vulcan statue is today a prominent feature of the Vulcan Park and Museum in Birmingham, Alabama, where it was originally cast. And the Smithsonian Institution coordinated the U.S. government government exhibits, and it featured a blue whale, the first full cast of a blue whale ever created. The fair hosted the 1904 Summer Olympic Games, the first Olympics ever held in the United States. And these games had originally been awarded to Chicago, but when St. Louis threatened to hold a rival international competition, the games were relocated. Nonetheless, the sporting events spread out over several months were overshadowed by the fair itself. With travel expenses high, many European athletes did not come, nor did modern Olympics founder Baron Pierre de Coubertin. On June 5, 1904, a bullfight scheduled for an arena just north of the fairgrounds in conjunction with the fair turned violent when Missouri Governor Alexander Monroe Dockery ordered police to halt the fight in light of Missouri's anti-bullfighting -bull laws. Disgruntled spectators demanded refunds, and when they were turned away, they began throwing stones through the windows of the arena office. While police protected the office, they did not have sufficient numbers to protect the, the arena, which was burned to the ground by the mob. The Exposition Fire Department responded to the fire, but disruption to the fair was minimal, as the riot took place on Sunday when the fair itself was closed. 
um, at attendees included um, some some notable, really notable entities of the of the time. Um, John Philip Sousa, whose band performed on opening day and several times during the fair. Thomas Edison is claimed to have attended. President Theodore Roosevelt opened the fair via telegraph, but did not attend personally until after the elections in November of 1904, as he claimed he did not want to use the fair for political purposes. Ragtime music was pop popularly featured at the fair, and Scott Joplin wrote the Cascades specifically for the fair, inspired by the waterfalls at the Grand Basin, and presumably he attended the fair. Helen Keller, who was 24 and graduated from Radcliffe College, gave a lecture in the main auditorium. And J.T. Stinson, a well-regarded fruit specialist, introduced the phrase, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, at a lecture during the exhibition. The French organist Alexander Guillemant played a series of 40 recitals from memory on the great organ in the festival hall, then the largest pipe organ in the world. And Geronimo, the former war chief of the Apache, was on display in a teepee in the ethnology exhibit. Henry Poincaré gave a keynote address on mathematical physics, including an outline for what would eventually become known as special relativity. Relativity, excuse me. Jelly Roll Morton did not visit, stating in his uh, letter, Library of Congress interview and recordings that he expected Jan, jazz pianist Tony Jackson would attend and win a jazz piano competition at the exposition. Morton said he was quite disgusted to later learn that Jackson hadn't gone either and that the competition had been won instead by Alfred Wilson. Morton considered himself a better pianist than Wilson. The poet T.S. Eliot, who was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, visited the Igrot village held in the Philippine Exposition section of the St. Louis World's Fair. And several months after the closing of the World's Fair, he published a short story entitled The Man Who Was King in the school magazine of Smith Academy, St. Louis, Missouri, that he was attending. Inspired by the Ganza dance, which the Igrot people presented regularly in the village and their reaction to civilization, the poet explored the interaction of the white man with an island culture. Interestingly, all this predates the poet's delving into the anthropological studies during his Harvard graduate years. Max Weber visited uh, upon first coming to the United States in hopes of using some of his findings for a case study on capitalism. Jack Daniels, the American distiller and the founder of Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey Distil Distillery, entered his Tennessee whiskey into the World's Fair Whiskey Competition, and after four hours of deliberation, the eight judges awarded Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey the gold medal for the finest whiskey in the world, and the award was a boon for the Jack Daniels Distillery. Novelist Kate Chopin lived nearby and purchased a season ticket to the fair. After her visit on the hot day of August 20th, she suffered a brain hemorrhage and died two days later on August 22nd, 1904. And finally, Philadelphia <clears throat> mercantilist John Wanamaker visited the exposition in November 1904 and purchased an entire collection of German furniture which included the giant Jugendstil brace, uh, brass sculpture of an eagle that would display in the rotunda of his Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia. And he also purchased the organ from the fair, which at the time, as, our, as I've already said, was the biggest concert organ in the world. And... Um, that's uh, information I've gathered on the World's Fair, again, after becoming interested because of the, uh, the one piece that I told you about in the beginning. Hope you've enjoyed this, um, and uh, hope to talk with you all soon.